This is one of my favorite parts. Um, <laughs> So uh, just so everyone's prepared to take a question and uh, there's, we can identify any snafus, uh, I know we are waiting on one panel member who will hopefully be here by the time the real questions get here. So uh, we've sent someone else to look for him. All right. So test question. Uh, Kendall Square in Cambridge was almost named headquarters to which of the following major American institutions, creating its reputation as a technology hub? And we should have 12 votes, I know. They're here, they're here, yeah. 12 points. Yep. And despite the major technology hub, this never goes off without a glitch. <laughs> So we have, the results are in, Bell Telephone Company, IBM, NASA are split. The correct answer is NASA. Uh, JFK moved to vacate several buildings by eminent domain after his moonshot speech. Uh, and when he was assassinated, LBJ moved NASA down to Houston. Um, and then several buildings sat vacant in Kendall for 20 years because they had been vacated. Just a little fact. <laughs> Thank you, Celia. That's usually the highlight of the voting uh, process. <laughs> we do hope that there's a little less uh, politics involved in the subsequent votes than there was in the location of NASA um, through the years. But now I think we are fully set up to um, be able to vote after we discuss the, the, the questions. All right, so with this phase of the meeting, um, requires and offers is the opportunity to reflect back again on the evidence, um, the testimony from clinical experts and patients and other commentators, um, and to pull it all together um, for the CPAC uh, to vote. We have, uh, continuing at the front table here, patient representatives and clinical experts. We have the ICER research team <clears throat> over there. So let's move into the first question um, and uh, have you start to consider it. So for all of the questions, we are, just want to make sure everybody's aware that for the patient population that we are referring to, there are patients with hemophilia A with inhibitors to factor eight who will not be treated with immune tolerance induction or for whom ITI has been unsuccessful. And when necessary, age ranges are being specified in the voting questions. So for the first question, it reads, for patients under 12 years of age, is the evidence adequate to demonstrate that prophylactic emicizumab provides a net health benefit compared with no prophylactic therapy? Yes or no? I will remind CPAC that you also have the evidence summary, the tables, the key tables from the overall report there in your blue binders. And let me just invite uh, David Wren to 
again, briefly summarize which key tables you think they should be referring to. Uh, foolishly, I didn't bring the key And I can bring that up to you. Here, David. Thank you. So, I believe we provided. Got it. Oh, thanks. We have um, both our assessment of the evidence ratings in table two, and I can come back to how we got there. And then for the younger population, you have uh, table, I believe, six, which is in Haven 2, the younger population, which gives you uh, in table six the, the numbers of patients who had no bleeds, who had zero bleeds of the various sorts. And then in table seven gives you this, again, before-after comparison uh, to BPA prophylaxis, but that's not compared this question is against no prophylaxis, so it gives you a sense against BPA prophylaxis and those relative risks, but it's not completely irrelevant to think about that because we have randomized trial data showing that bleeding rates are lower, including in younger patients, with BPA prophylaxis than no prophylaxis. So by transitivity, if you believe those data that it's lower than BPA prophylaxis, it would also be lower than no prophylaxis. Questions, Rob? Yeah. So, uh, David, could you just address um, the, the, or characterize the nature of the Haven 2 data? As I understand it, there's, that study is still ongoing, and the only results that have been released have been done so through a conference abstract. And at this point, there's been no formal peer review, uh, nor has there been a formal ISO review of the data quality. That those are both fair statements. They've also been press releases, but press releases, conference presentations, and abstracts. All right. Teresa? So, so for this, this question, we, we don't have the, any direct evidence, right, um, from Haven 1 or Haven 2 for this population. Um, and, you know, you're inferring this. ICER is referring this and it's giving it a B plus rating based on the Haven 2 data. Um, I'm wondering just from the clinical experts, like what's your experience in the less than 12 uh, population, you know, with emicizumab versus no prophylaxis? I would say uniformly across the clinical trial program, it's probably been superior um, to the older patients. And that <clears throat> uh, shouldn't be surprising because in the younger patients, they haven't accumulated a lot of the um, chronic arthropathy that is um, characteristic of the older adolescent and adult population. So what we're dealing with in the pediatric population are not sort of all of the sort of joint pathology type complaints as much as we are dealing with actual bleeding. And so um, in, in many respects, I think the HAVEN2 data is maybe a better reflection of the hemostatic uh, protection offered by the agent um, versus some of the other symptomatic things that have turned up in the older patients. So my perspective of, of interpreting the data and of uh, uh, seeing patients who are participating is that this is highly efficacious in this, uh, in this subgroup of patients. And, and, you know, I would just say one other thing. When the data were first presented for the HAVEN 2, not, not yet published but abstract, um, it is one of the only meetings I've ever seen where people stood up and clapped because the difference in the patient's burden with this drug was so profound. So I, I think there were, I think it is profound in terms of talking to, to parents and patients. Um, the FDA has certainly reviewed this for its approval, and uh, I don't know if it's in the evidence that you see, but, but they didn't distinguish on their label um, by age cohort, right. and, they, right. and, and they may well see more data than what, what this panel sees. I, I, I don't know that uh, for a fact, but I think that is, and, and certainly the money shot in, in any treatment with hemophilia is getting into the early ages, uh, and the numbers are smaller, and, particularly, and there are numbers even in some of that have been reported below the age of two. But, Joint damage is something that occurs over decades, uh, and the early bleeds actually are treated and resolved 
relatively quickly. Uh, it's only the cumulative effect where it gets more complicated. So I, I don't think there's any reason to believe differently, nor do I think the risk-benefit profile, because I th you know, we've talked briefly earlier about the, uh, uh, the TMAs and the other adverse events. I, I believe uh, that uh, the patients, even after those events occurred and the black box warning went in, that they were even reconsented. And I don't think there were any patients that opted to, to go off, even in light of knowing that there might be uh, a potential another risk that was sitting out there. I can be corrected if that's if that's wrong, but I think even in the light of the risk-benefit profile, the younger patients opted to stay on. Good. Thank you very much. Any other questions or considerations from the CPAC on this question? All right, why don't you go ahead and vote? You have 13, 13, correct? All right, 13 responses. All right. The answers should appear. 11 and 2. All right. Now, sometimes we uh, do kind of a, a dive, a deeper dive before the vote is taken to try to explore people's rationales for their votes, and sometimes we follow up after the vote. Um, because it adds some, in some ways to the transparency to the, to the final uh, product. So it, uh, did anybody who voted know that the evidence was not adequate, would they like to express what their thinking was behind it not being adequate? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say that I think the lack of peer-reviewed evidence is really an important criteria here. And it's not my uh, enthusiasm for what I can see so far, but I think I'd lose my card in the researchers' guild if I said that unpublished evidence was sufficient at this point. So that's my no vote. Right. Same, same. I'm not saying that. Again, it's we're not saying that it's not there. Is, you know, it's 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 not uh, um, preferred, but that there isn't. We don't have the evidence yet. All right. Same. Okay. So why don't we move forward then, thank you, to the next voting question, which is 1B. So what we're doing now is shifting the question, the same question, but for the older patients. So here for patients 12 years of age or older, is the evidence adequate, again, to demonstrate that prophylactic emicizumab provides a net health benefit compared with no prophylactic therapy? David, can you summarize again the state of the evidence for this? Uh, in your packet, and this is our randomized comparison. So we don't have huge numbers here, but very profound results with significant p-values in a randomized comparison. All right. So it's some of the same issues, obviously, around benefits and risks and the same treatment, slightly older populations. Does anybody have any questions about the strength of evidence aspects of this one? All right, I'll ask in advance this time. Is anybody contemplating voting no on this one? Who would like to explain why? Anybody voting yes? Want to say anything about why it's a yes instead of a no? Steve? As an ultra-rare disease, we're going to have to expect lower um, patient numbers and uh, trial duration than um, we might otherwise see in some of the other conditions that we've looked at. And I think this outcome of net health benefit to me is perhaps more achievable than if we were evaluating efficacy. So those are two considerations in my mind for voting yes. Anybody want to add anything distinctive to that in their thinking? Okay. Why don't we go ahead and vote on this question then, please? A is yes, B is no. Just waiting for two more responses.
still waiting on one more. Is it you? Okay. Got it. <laughs> All right, we're good to go. Oops, now I have to get out of this, I guess. All right, there was great suspense around that one, I know, and the answer is 13 yes and zero no. Okay. Let's go ahead now because the comparison here changes. Question 2A is, for the younger patients again this time, for patients under the age of 12, is the evidence adequate to demonstrate that prophylactic emicizumab provides net health benefits compared with prophylactic therapy with bypassing agents? Yes or no? David, you're up again. So here we have the actual comparison as opposed to the transitive comparison looking at Table 7 from the Haven 2 trial. Again, we're talking about 23 patients. Um, the bleeding rate on amixizumab, annualized bleeding rate was 0 0.2. The prior observational bleeding rate was 17.2 on BPA prophylaxis. So observationally, a very large magnitude of reduction, sort of a stunningly large magnitude of reduction, and the question comes how much you have to worry about bias and confounding in this observational comparison and how much you think that sways you away from believing what the results are showing. Correct? Um, I should have for you what, at what point that was. 12, 12 weeks? 12 yeah. weeks. Okay. So, any further? Yes, Lefterios, I see a question. Should they allow for combination? Because we heard before that that is more of a real life situation. Combination of the BP agents, you mean? That's what I heard that uh, is used very frequently as an option. It has to be either or or both. No, it's unusual for them to be on combination prophylaxis, prophylaxis. with, okay. with yeah, yeah. bypassing agents, but for acute bleed treatment, point. they often would use both agents. Good question. Jason? <clears throat> I, I just sort of wanted to ask out loud. I mean, the, the obvious issue that I think we all have to struggle with right now is that uh, there's, in this particular example, there's an extremely large effect that we're observing with observational data that are potentially prone to uh, uh, selection biases. Uh, but, but again, in the setting of an enormously large effect. And I guess I just had a general question uh, for, for, the, for anyone in the room about are there differences in how um, rigorous we need to be in assessing statistical methods uh, for children as opposed to adults? Are, are there differences in the threshold to conduct a randomized control trial for children versus adults? No, I mean, the most famous uh, trial in the U.S. was the U.S. Joint Outcome Study, which was enrolling uh, infants, um, uh, you know, in the first two years of life. They were enrolled in a randomized controlled study. This is in non-inhibitors to prophylaxis versus on-demand treatment. Um, and uh, even though we had tons of observational data with large cohorts, uh, other countries, everyone felt that that randomized control study was landmark and it was definitive and it was a necessity to establish for good the uh, impact of prophylaxis. So I don't think we are, there isn't a barrier to do um, a randomized control trial uh, if, if the need is there. I'm not sure this really addresses your question, but I know in terms of the risks of the research itself that, that certain, you know, kind of authorities who look at the, at the risks of research do feel that there's a special burden in pediatric research to describe those risks to try to calibrate them versus the potential benefits for, for knowledge for all, et cetera. But it, it, it's not that it's in a completely different ballpark, but it's definitely something that they, that they think about. Your question was more about do we need more or less certainty about the outcomes of a, of a result, I think. Wasn't that more of, more of your question? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. There, I think it's, it's probably just too hard to generalize. We don't have anyone from the FDA here, but certainly it, they twin that with input from the patient community around the unmet need. And depending on how high the unmet need is, some people believe that there is some modulation of, 
the uncertainty that would be tolerated, if you will, um, by the FDA and others. Mark or, or Sonia, would you like to comment? I mean, you guys, obviously, the hemophilia community, we'll talk about this in the policy roundtable too, I mean, there's maybe no community that has been so attuned to wanting and needing new innovation and who has had such a checkered history of innovation uh, you know, and, and treatment having real risk. So the risk averseness of that community. How, how would you answer the, the question that, uh, that Jason posed? Well, I, I would just say that from the families that I know and were direct, in direct communication with, they were clamoring to get on study. People were begging. They were traveling across the country. Um, they, they were desperate to get yeah. on study. Yeah, and that's what I was sort of alluding to before. The, the risk-benefit profile is unique, whether you have an inhibitor or don't have an inhibitor, and how I would view a risk as a non-inhibitor patient versus an inhibitor patient. Life with an inhibitor is just pure hell. And so even in light of the, the, the known adverse events and, and the corrective actions that were taken in terms of the protocol, uh, patients were not fleeing from the drug. They were still clamoring to get on the drug, is my, is my assessment. So I think it's something the community is perhaps uniquely equipped to assess and address. I mean, we're not doctors, obviously, but, uh, but we have a history, and so there's a lot of us that are looking out. Yeah. And I think, and I think wisely. I mean, there, it, it's not that people were rushing. They were asking the appropriate questions. They were, some were more cautious than others, um, but, but people were, were very aware of what the risks were and, and had done their research before just blindly signing, signing consent forms. Mm -hmm. Um, at least I, I didn't see in the tables, you didn't consider the data from the Japanese cohorts where this was, um, this was first pioneered, but um, I believe it was a total of 18 mm -hmm. patients right. um, so that we had um, um, data in um, that preceded the Haven group of trials. And uh, those patients uh, continued on drug even after the Japanese cohort trial was, was completed. So um, the news of how they had done on this uh, drug didn't take long before that was well communicated um, in other parts of the world. So that did have an influence in, in how the Haven uh, trials were enrolled based on that background of information. Great. Any other questions from CPAC? Okay. Why don't you go ahead and put in your vote, please? Thank you. 11 yes and 2 no. All right, again, um, I think the record appreciates having some reflection of the diversity of opinion. So anybody who voted no on this one, would they like to uh, state why? Is it the same? Uh, yeah, same vote? reason. Okay. I think it, it, it's just the status of same. the evidence Understood. Uh, at this point. Okay. I actually voted the same time. Oh, okay. Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Anything different? Or is it the I, same I reason? I had trepidation to say yes, but I... Yeah, some of these are close calls, but um, I think if I have any meaning to the word adequacy of evidence, I have to draw a line somewhere. This is one single arm, you know, very small trial, observational, sorry, observational data only. Um, yeah, you know, okay, not enough. Thank you. Okay, yes, Maggie. It might be worth mentioning that this is an orphan disease, and all of the drugs that we use are actually approved if they are randomized, large randomized studies, it's because they're done across the world. So anything that's done uh, in small sample sizes is pretty standard for this uh, population, be that as it may, that it's not a randomized uh, study. All right, thanks. So let's go to the next question, the last of the comparative clinical effectiveness questions. and. It is, as you expect, for patients ages 12 and older. The same comparison. Is the evidence adequate to demonstrate net prophylactic, sorry, net health benefits with prophylactic emicizumab, 
uh, compared with prophylactic therapy with bypassing agents. David? Um, to Table 5, we're at the Haven 1 population again, but the observational Haven 1 population before or after. Uh, you see the reductions compared with prior bypassing agent prophylaxis that actually look similar to what emixizumab showed in the randomized comparison in terms of the percent reduction in annualized bleeding rate. Um, as you heard, I have some concerns, we had some concerns that this may overstate the overall benefit. Um, but even when we look at the randomized comparisons and do cross-trial comparisons, we still see what looks like a greater benefit um, with emixizumab. And truth is probably somewhere between those numbers, I would guess. Okay. Any questions or comments from the CPAC? All right. You guys are going to get spoiled, these reviews where there's one study to talk about. That's, that's far, far too easy for you guys in many ways. All right. Please go ahead and vote. Okay. There we go, 13-0. All right, for those of you who, who are fans of consistency, we've just seen a fair amount of consistency, and I think the, the message and the, the interpretation of the evidence came through clearly in your comments and your earlier questions. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to a different phase of the voting in which we use very small font, unfortunately, um, but we'd like to list the specific potential other benefits that is our standard list with all interventions. And there's always one at the bottom that says, you know, are there any other really important potential benefits or disadvantages that should be considered by policymakers as well as by patients and clinicians in thinking about the long-term value of, uh, of the intervention under, dis uh, under discussion. So here I need to frame it again by saying that the comparison at the top is important. The comparison here is, is to ask, when compared to prophylactic therapy with BPAs, does emicizumab offer one or more of the following other benefits? And CPAC is asked to select all that apply. And I am going to read them very quickly, just so the audience understands what the considerations are. And then we'll go through them and, and seek comments and, and further input. So A is offers reduced complexity that will significantly improve patient outcomes. B is reduces important health disparities across racial, ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, or regional categories. C is it significantly reduces caregiver or broader family burden. D, it offers a novel mechanism of action or approach that will allow successful treatment of many patients who have failed other available treatments. E, it has a significant impact on improving patients' ability to return to work and or their overall productivity. F, it has a significant positive impact outside the family, including on schools and or communities. G, is that it has a significant impact on the entire infrastructure of care. And by that, we, we intend to include the effects on screening of affected patients, on sensitization of clinicians to the condition, um, the dissemination of understanding about the condition um, in ways that could really change, revolutionize how patients are cared for in many ways that extend beyond the treatment itself. And H, again, is that opportunity to identify other potential benefits or disadvantages that could be, again, it could be important that you think they should. We heard, I thought, very well-structured um, testimony from patient representatives earlier in the day. I believe some of the manufacturer comments um, address some of these issues as well. Um, I'd like to specifically invite the patient representatives up uh, at the table now to comment on this first, and then I'll open it up to CPAC um, for their questions and comments. Mark or Sonia? So, me as, I, as I refer to some notes here, um, but I'll begin by saying we didn't know in my family how bad having an inhibitor was until we actually came out of that and being on the study. Um, in the four months prior to, to starting Emmy, we were hospitalized four times and used $2 million in health care in, in four months' time. 
Um, he routinely missed more than 60 days of school. I'm happy to report that since being on study, he has not missed school due to hemophilia at all. Um, we were able to take his port out. Previous to this, he had had five ports, four pick lines, and two Broviacs. Um, we lived in a world of crisis and unpredictability hour by hour. So being able to plan your life and not lose birthday party invitations and being able to send your child out to do regular normal childhood things, it makes a tremendous impact. My daughters don't have to, they don't have to guess who's gonna pick them up from school anymore or whether mommy is gonna be in the emergency room with her son. Um, it is, the, the quality of life issue, I cannot emphasize enough, is tremendous. Um, we, we can live a life finally, um, and it's, it's incredible to think about. Thanks. Mark, anything you'd like to add? Um, so as I've noted, I, I don't have an inhibitor, but I have a lot of buddies uh, uh, that do, and the transformative effect uh, of what um, what a subcutaneous therapy that actually controls the bleeding can do is is, is pretty stunning. Uh, you know, uh, one uh, one guy was telling me he, he has a girlfriend for the first time. He can actually you know, have a relationship and and consistently be there and, and be present. Uh, another told me that he's now confident about going to college, uh, that he can actually continue his education uh, and and plan a career. Um, you know, these are the kind of metrics that are, are really hard to capture in what ICER does. Um, and you know, the bleeding uh, change, uh, albeit significant, um, really is, um, I think, is, is not what it's, what it's all about. If I had a bleed and it didn't interfere with my life in terms of pain or limitations, um, then, then maybe it's not a big deal. But it's the knock-on effect of what really is the real patient outcome that um, living with an inhibitor, uh, it affects your ability to go to school, which means you can't get an education, which means that uh, it's often difficult to support a family, uh, the social life is impacted, and, and you just can't plan your career. And, and it doesn't only affect the patient, it affects the entire family unit. The siblings are affected, the jobs. Uh, I've picked where I've been in my life uh, based on where there's a treatment center, uh, and I've turned down uh, careers and job moves uh, because I knew I wouldn't have access to care, and I don't have an inhibitor, uh, and, and just magnify that uh, for those that do. So, so the context of this, uh, I think, is amazing. Uh, I, I've even heard some of my buddies that uh, you know, talk about uh, how they're a little bit jealous that uh, uh, those with inhibitors now are the ones that have the subcutaneous treatment, and we're, we're still sticking ourselves three or four times a week, and that's assuming we get it right um, uh, the first time. Uh, so the, um, uh, I think it is um, you know, sort of is the beginning. We won't see even perhaps or, or know what the benefits are for a long term because the decision that I make as a child uh, or even the decisions I was making in high school about where to go to college and the career, you don't really see the net benefit for that for maybe two or three decades. So it, it is hard perhaps to estimate or really understand how transformative something like this can be. Thanks very much. CPAC members, do you have any questions or comments? And I'd invite you also, if you have uh, specific thoughts ahead of time that you're going to vote yes or no and you'd like to share your reasoning with the rest of, of CPAC, it's very helpful at this point to engage in that kind of shared thinking. Lefterius? So the emotional distress that we feel hearing those stories earlier today. Uh, I need some help to define failed treatment for this disease. Uh, I'm not asking about the novelty of the mode of action, mm -hmm. but the second part, I don't know how to define the failed treatment and if this is going to be helpful to that. So I would like some help. Well, first, actually, before I even let Mark answer, uh, as part of a learning experiment at ICER, we decide to make bad errors every once in a while and see if people catch them. And this is one. Uh, patients don't fail treatments. Treatments fail patients. So just know that we know that and that that's a kind of a, a hidden trick, just so you know. Will be addressed. Mark, please. Well, so I, I think 
what we're referring to now is maybe even moving into the area of, uh, of immune tolerance or overcoming uh, the inhibitors. And so for patients who uh, are diagnosed with an inhibitor and either go on to an immune tolerance regime to try to overcome that inhibitor or who can, um, who, who are going to one of the alternate therapies that, or combinations of therapies to manage it. So I, I think the failure we're thinking about now is in terms of, uh, of immune tolerance when they really are at no other option. The existing standard of care is not working for them. The ability to overcome the inhibitor and try to return to a more normal standard of care is not working for them. They have no real other uh, alternative. Uh, they're really just facing a future of uh, morbidity and early mortality. Uh, it is, um, uh, and, and this uh, really gives hope and, and brings a new perspective. I, I don't know if Sonia wants to, to talk about her son, but I mean, they had an extraordinary amount of time uh, on, uh, on immune tolerance. Yeah, so my son developed his inhibitor after his 11th infusion of factor eight at seven months old. And we immediately began immune tolerance and continued on that until he was 12 years old. So daily infusions of factor eight, sometimes even twice daily, we tried different, uh, different regimens. He still bled on top of that. We tried prophylactic bypassing agent, um, therapy on and off throughout those years, still bled, has two target joints, um, and as I said, multiple hospitalizations a year, must, multiple ER visits a year. Um, I, ITT failed us, and thank you for making that, for making that distinction, because it's, it's a hot spot for me, because God knows we tried. God knows we tried, and, and it just simply did not work, and I think earlier there was some data that I, Dr. Pipe helped me out here, but only 20% it works, ITT work or I, ITI works in. Um, it, it's not a sure thing that you're going to ever eradicate your inhibitor. Yeah, I, it, it depends. If we're going to talk about hemophilia A, um, there probably overall maybe two thirds of patients are ultimately tolerized, but your definition of what is tolerance can vary uh, depending on those trials. Some patients seemingly are on almost continuous ITI but it provides enough hemostatic benefit for them that the clinicians and the family agree to continue it indefinitely. So whether you want to call that high-dose prophylaxis at that point or ITI, it, it depends. But true tolerance endpoints have fluctuated over the years, and so determining success, failure, or partial success has been a little bit difficult, actually. And, and actually, just to add to that, I, I actually asked my doctor before coming here, uh, some of his thoughts on, on our specific case, and he said he specifically wrote in our, our chart, patient has been in constant bleeding state since t stopping ITI. So we did get some benefit from it, but he did continue to bleed even on ITI. Okay, great. Comments? Yes, Roger. Sorry, Roger, can you use the microphone? Just lean in. Uh, for Sanji, uh, when you've got a kid who's got problems, they get a lot more attention because they have to, and the siblings sometimes resent that. Have you had to deal with that, and, and what have you been able to do? Absolutely. Can my daughters, I think I hate them. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous burden. Um, I, I, I wish I had counted how many times my kids didn't know who was going to, my girls didn't know who was going to pick them up from school or the number of times that they woke up in the morning and I wasn't there because in the middle of the night I had to take Thomas to the emergency room. Um, so they definitely felt like they were second-class citizens. Um, a, you know, another funny antidote was the amount of money I spent on my girls because every time I was hospitalized with Thomas, the mommy guilt crept in and I would buy gifts for my girls trying to buy back what, what they had lost. So, I mean, the amount of time I think that's what it comes down to for me, the amount of time that I've lost with my girls because I was so hyper-focused on taking care of, of Thomas. Um, you can't get that back. I, I think it's important, and the burden is not just on the siblings, but it's on the marital unit themselves, the mom and the dad. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a genetic disease. Uh, the female is the carrier. Uh, often there's a lot of guilt and, and emotional turmoil that comes, uh, comes with that and, and the coping. Uh, and then the burdens that it places on employment. Uh, families can't be two income families uh, where they both work. And a lot of burden is placed on one. So there, 
the husband or the mom is, is working more extensively. They're missing out on other economic benefits. The money is all going to take care of the one child. Um, so the extras such as summer camps and, uh, and other kinds of activities just disappear from the budget. Uh, and, and that puts a lot of stress on, on the parents, on top of financial stress that just exists in families uh, today anyway. All right, thank you. Other thoughts from CPAC on particular potential other benefits or disadvantages that you would like to raise before we vote, Jean? Well, uh, first of all, there's an impact on gender. Uh, hemophilia affects boys and men. Um, and I am particularly struck, I'm going to give you an H, Stephen, mm -hmm. because um, even though the evidence, uh, as my researcher colleagues want to remind me, for the under 12 population was a little new, um, when you have the prospect of an effective prophylaxis for a pediatric population that families and parents can actually do, that is enormous. That is huge, and um, that weighs heavily on my mind uh, with all of these. So noted. So noted. Uh, Chris and then Jason. improves adherence, reduces stress, uh, reduces stigma, pain, uh, increases convenience. Uh, so all of these kind of tangibles. Um, you know, I think that uh, the co-payment question is something that really should be addressed, and it should be addressed uh, with the participation of the pharma companies. You know, if, if patients are exhausting their co-payment on the second of the year, uh, that can lead to declining adherence, and uh, no one benefits from that. So I just wanted to make that point. Give us 30 minutes and you will be there, I promise. <laughs> uh, Jason. I, I just, I'm compelled by a lot of the comments and the other groups that I've heard already, but I wanted to add another H um, concept. I was, I was thinking about this when I was reviewing uh, the data and preparing for the session. I, you know, my doctor, but I, I don't deal with hemophilia. I'm a, I'm a cardiologist and I don't have these patients. Um, but I was thinking back, I, I did once know more about hemophilia when I was in medical school. So hemophilia is a big deal in medical school, right? Because it's the way you teach medical students about the clotting cascade. It's the way you teach basic Mendelian principles to medical students. So it made me realize that the, the suffering and the sacrifice of uh, patients with hemophilia, and it's a genetic disorder, so in many cases it's people in their families, have contributed of all the horrible suffering and the voluntary participation in research, it's contributed enormously to all of us who practice medicine, our understanding of basic mechanism, our understanding of principles about blood supply and sort of presenting iatrogenic infection, that voting yes for H gives me an opportunity to testify uh, that the suffering of the patients in these families with hemophilia have given uh, benefits that have benefited patients that uh, medicine generally and patients that do not have hemophilia. I understand better about when to use anticoagulants in patients that have history of thrombosis because of the suffering of the hemophiliacs and voting yes on H gives me an opportunity to testify to that sacrifice. Thank you very much. All right, why don't we go ahead and vote then. Now for H, what we are going to do is to capture the additional suggestions made, and we're not going to try to have three separate votes. We're going to indicate that they were considered as important potential other benefits by members of CPAC with without vote. It'll, just, it'll make it easier for the structure. But for what we've got now, if you can vote on A through G. And remember, it's as many as apply in your mind. And you can take a second again to look at the language. But feel free to go ahead and start voting at this point. I forget how we know when we're done with the voting at this point. I'm just going to have to ask in a few seconds whether everybody's done voting. I don't think there's a way that the system will tell me when folks are done, right? Okay, well, we'll give it a couple seconds. I think we have one more person who's finishing their votes, I think. So we're almost there. Do you want to go scan the 
and see if there we go. All right. You're about to see the results. I hope it comes up in a format that doesn't get Okay. Um, it's kind of hard to do that, I understand, yeah. technically. I don't think we can go backwards. Did you vote on any, but just not? Okay, well, if you're the only one who had that problem, then we can single you out and let you finish the rest of your votes now, just so people can capture the fullness. Are you okay with that? No, I know. We're just going to add it in our heads. So, 11A, and Austin, you get to say if it's two or three for B. Three, three for B, 12 or 13, 13 for C, nine for D, 12 for E, nine for F, and G? Three. Three for G. All right. H is eight. H is eight. And we will come back. Actually, we'll figure out a way to try to tease out the, I mean, I thought the things you guys brought up were great. I just didn't see an easy way for us to take three additional or even more additional votes. So we'll, but we'll, we'll capture both from what you said and, and perhaps some further feedback with the, the diversity of H's. So thank you. You can see there were a fair number of these for which the, a great majority of the CPAC thought there were um, significant potential other benefits. So let's turn now to the contextual considerations. These are a, a smattering of issues that tend to relate to the nature of the condition and special, again, kind of contextual issues around the evidence that for many people uh, can be important in thinking about value. They don't always apply. Um, it's just we, we like to try to address or acknowledge them when they do. So option A here, and I just read the question. It says, are any of the following contextual considerations important in assessing MSSMAB's long-term value for money? A, it's intended for the care of individuals with a condition of particularly high severity in terms of impact on length of life and or quality of life. B, it's intended for the care of individuals with a condition that represents a particularly high lifetime burden of illness. C, it's the first intervention to ever offer any improvement for patients with this condition. D, compared to prophylactic therapy with BPAs, there's significant uncertainty about the long-term risk of serious side effects of this intervention. E is compared to prophylactic therapy with BPAs, there's significant uncertainty about the magnitude or durability of the long-term benefits of this intervention. And F is your, um, again, ability to identify an important other contextual consideration. Let me start with a CPAC this time and see if you guys have any thoughts. Steve, I'm yes. having trouble getting it to register more than two. Selections. Yeah, I'm going to, so you guys right. should start the discussion and I'm going to fix it so right. you can select more. So I wasn't supposed to vote then, you're saying? I'm reprimanded for that? <laughs> too early. And, and I'll restart the question. <laughs> Until we get this sorted. So. I'll probably invite some comment from here, but let me start with a CPAC this time. As you read this list of contextual considerations, which are you, are you feeling are important uh, in this particular situation? Jean? I don't want to sound like a Scrooge here because I'm not on this issue, but it has occurred to me that even though there is a, a, a great um, benefit of cost effectiveness with this treatment, it's still a huge amount of money. Um, and, and, and its comparative treatments are even, are even huger. So um, I, I just don't want it to go unmarked that we're talking about incredibly high price treatments here. I'm really delighted that there may be very effective treatments at, and, and save money, um, but it's still... Um, all right. Again, that will be a, a, a tasty morsel for the policy roundtable, but I also think it's, it's worth considering as part of an, of an F, of a, an additional contextual consideration when people are thinking about value in this space. Anybody else seeing any contextual considerations that they think are worthy of discussion? Yes, Rob. One around F to just call attention to, I think, a, a 
great treatment of this in the report, which is the experience of this patient population with HIV and Hep C, and how this is a, now a mechanism of action that moves us past those, those types. Of, hopefully, we're past those types of risks anyway in the blood supply, but um, it's still, I think, an important consideration. Okay. Sonia or Mark, did you guys think of these issues before? I don't know if you thought of these specific contextual issues before the meeting or not, but welcome any thoughts that you have on how these look, how questions like this look to the patient community when they think about their situation. I, I did, and I, and I think, you know, the answers to the first couple are, are, are A and B, the yes is clear. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and I also think the answer to C is, is relatively clear, no. I mean, we, we have to acknowledge that 5 and OO7 both were huge advances when they came about for patients with inhibitors in terms of is it, is it the first to offer any improvement. And so there have been um, small improvements that have occurred along the line. Um, in terms of D, um, I, you know, there are events in the news, and while I, I don't know that uh, I have significant uncertainty based on the information that's available, I think it just highlights and underscores the importance of longitudinal uh, data collection and the importance for surveillance, uh, which is something that we would be asking for. But the, but the risk-benefit trade-off of life without having leads managed uh, versus that that, uh, that we at least know about today. Um, I don't have significant uncertainty there how that risk-benefit trade-off would, would come down. Uh, I would answer E, no. And, uh, and, and under F, I, um, uh, I think the comment I was going to make is uh, we really still are on a journey. This is, this is not the end. Uh, for inhibitors. Uh, this is perhaps a significant step forward, but we don't understand why inhibitors occur. We don't understand who's going to develop them. Uh, this isn't a, a cure, uh, and so we're really just managing still a complex uh, adverse event that uh, occurs in 30 percent of the patients. So it, it's a great treatment, but it isn't, it isn't the end of the game. And so I don't know how that scores in an F, but I think it's important that we underscore that this, you know, this isn't the end. Uh, maybe we've reached a big step. Okay. Clinical experts, anything you'd like to add? It may have already been yeah, yeah. well said. I would Obviously say, it was, but. <laughs> yeah, I would say just carrying what Mark said, just the next step, which is what we really need to do is prevent inhibitors. And, uh, you know, uh, the NIH is holding a symposium in May that many of us are working on, and the whole idea there is to eradicate inhibitors, and we will be looking at drugs like Hemlibra and other drugs to prevent the occurrence of inhibitors. So those, these are critical issues, so we don't even have this problem to deal with. We don't know these answers. We need a lot of really important scientific research to, to get those answers, but I actually think that is the number one question. How can we prevent these very burdensome inhibitors? Okay. Uh, let me start with uh, Claudia and then Furios. Yes. Uh, in looking at questions D and E, uh, I agree with you with D uh, and what your comments were, uh, Mark, about that. Uh, but I also think with E, I am concerned. Uh, I, I don't want this to rain up on our parade. I think this is extremely exciting therapy, and we just don't have the long-term data. Um, with the experience that I've had with um, treating patients with anti-TNF medications, where I understand there haven't been antibodies seen at this point, there are cancer risk issues with at least the anti-TNFs, though it's, that would not be uh, germane here. There are potential for some long-term concerns that I would have. We just don't have that long-term experience. So that I don't want to see us utilizing these medications less, but it just again points out that we don't have the long-term data yet and we need a lot more information in regards to long-term benefits and the concerns about serious side effects. Can you I, to follow up? Sure, can, of course. Because I, because I think your point's absolutely, I think your point's absolutely correct. I think the, the one comment I would make, and, and maybe it again is just the perspective of the patient, uh, it, uh, and I think about this in the context of gene therapy, which is also advancing for hemophilia. If I could have 10 years free of hemophilia, um, that would be extraordinary, even if the durability uh, didn't last. So if a patient could have 10 years free of an inhibitor and then, have, and then think about an alternative or have to go back to standard of care, that's not insignificant. So, so maybe I'm weighing the, you know, uh, that benefit in my mind, but, but I absolutely agree with you. We don't necessarily know the long-term effect or what might happen down the road. 
Great, thank yeah, you. Left there, yes. I, I would just like to follow oh, up sorry. too with regards to the fact that um, you, know, you, you may have seen the data, two thirds of the patients uh, had no bleeds over the period of the study, but a third of the patients still did. And so what are we treating them with? We have to use bypassing agents. That's all we have available. So unless there's another innovation that doesn't have risk for um, uh, you know, challenges with concomitant interaction uh, on the background of emicizumab treatment, this is an ongoing issue for clinicians. So the risk mitigation has been very successful. But um, there's no guarantee in managing a bleed, any given bleed, that all clinicians always will be able to stay below the thresholds that have been recommended for the risk mitigation. And there's also risk the other direction in that if you, if you become so, um, if you like, afraid of using a treatment protocol for treating bleeding because you're worried about even a rare side effect, there is some risk that bleeds will not be treated sufficiently to get them under control quickly. And I think this is the sort of the um, pit of your stomach aspect of the, of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council as well, in that we want to make it clear to clinicians that they are, you know, really going over this substantially with the families, uh, because this is home-based care. And not all bleeds are managed by our oversight in the clinics. And so it may be that we will have to revert to that. If patients exceed a certain dose of, of, of drug for treating bleeds, we may have to ask them to come under our supervision, perhaps even into the hospital. Um, and there might be additional monitoring that's required. So I think we're trying to wrestle with this aspect that, um, as Mark said, we, this is not a cure. We've not eliminated inhibitors, and we still have to use bypassing agents. It's the only proven therapy for acute bleed treatment. And we have to find the right sweet spot for using these products in conjunction to achieve the best outcomes for patients. And it's going to be some careful, careful implementation broadly across our uh, treatment centers to make sure we do this safely and effectively um, and also um, ensure that um, we're working on all the other things that uh, Dr. Ragney talked about to make sure we can eradicate inhibitors entirely. All right, thank you. Lefteros, did you have another uh, question or comment? If there's going to be an impact in mortality, in mortality, in life expectancy of, of these individuals. For me, it's difficult to imagine that uh, uh, with such a difficult outcome, this uh, disease, uh, if it's treated better, won't uh, impact not only the, the overall health status, but also the life expectancy of the individuals. Did you equate, or if you thought that most of the bleeds were from, excuse me, most of the deaths were from bleeding, and you now have an agent that's going to reduce bleeds, one can go, therefore, perhaps the life expectancy will be longer. Clearly, to um, your all points, we really need a longer-term follow-up, but that's what we're looking at, among other things. Right, thanks. It's reasonable to infer. I mean, the life expectancy for someone living with an inhibitor uh, born today is shorter than someone without. And so to the extent that this is normalizing somebody's life with an inhibitor to closer to being without an inhibitor, you should be able to reasonably infer that it would have an impact uh, on, uh, a favorable impact on life expectancy. Yeah, li I think living with, for, for our family, living with hemophilia was kind of a dream. Living <laughs> with hemophilia and an inhibitor was a nightmare. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very helpful, and I think we should go ahead and have the CPAC take their votes at this time. I think I will hopefully be able to see who's voted so that I won't close it out too quickly. But again, vote for all that you think apply in this list.
Everybody done? All right. I have to get rid of this, though. Come back. There we go. All right. 12 for A, 13 for B, 0 for C, 8 for D, 8 for E, and 8 for F. All right, and again, we'll reach out to get some of the, of the kind of the um, richness of the F ideas so we can incorporate that as part of the final report. Thank you very much. That is the end of the voting process. We'll move directly into the policy roundtable. Um, we thank everybody. If they want, you can stand up where you are for 30 seconds. We're going to invite our payer representatives and representatives from the manufacturers to come up to the head table.